All right, uh, shall we begin? Hello, I'm Vagran Kaskadian. Uh, I would like to present to you my latest infatuation, uh, uh, my crush on GNU geeks. Um, I'll start off with, uh, it's kind of awkward calling it GNU geeks, especially when you're talking about crushes, but um, uh, it, I, for the longest time, pronounced it GUIX. Uh, it's a bit awkward in conversations talking to people, they don't know what you mean, are you the intersection of people interested in GNU geeks and who are geeks interested in GNU is pretty high. But anyway, um, despite uh, awkward naming conventions, uh, I, I'm pretty interested in this new system. Uh, it's got its quirks. It's, it's a bit of a curiosity. Um, and I think there's also a, a really interesting, uh, a really solid community alignment uh, with a lot of the values that Debian shares. So a bit about myself, um, I'll just reduce it down to some basic numbers. Uh, I've been a Debian user since probably around 2001. Um, I got involved, I got deeply involved in Debian in DebCon 4 back in 2004. Uh, I became a Debian maintainer around 2008 and a developer in 2010. And, uh, my stats with GNU Geeks are a bit fresher, which is a bit more exciting. Uh, I've got, uh, I started submitting bugs and kind of hanging out in the channel kind of late last year and started getting some patches into the Geeks uh, Git repository just earlier this year. Um, so I'm kind of doing this as a, as a compare and contrast of Debian, uh, so I, I just figure I will briefly touch on at least some small piece of Debian. Uh, most notably that Debian is a volunteer effort and they want to focus on a free high quality Unix operating system. Uh, and this I just cut from the uh, Debian fac. Uh, of course Debian is much more than just the, this few simple lines, but uh, Interestingly enough, uh, GNU Geeks, the GNU system distribution, and the GNU Geeks package manager are free software projects developed by volunteers. So there's a pretty strong uh, alignment there. Uh, the, the free software values, uh, the volunteer-driven, community-driven focus, uh, that's pretty similar and I think uh, bears in mind some value commonality there. <laughs> Uh, what, where it kind of differs a little bit more is GNU Geeks is a re-implementation of the Nix build system, uh, and the re-implementation is done in GNU Guile. Uh, it also operates as a standalone package manager, uh, interestingly enough, on top of other distributions, maybe you know of some, and uh, it also has a full operating system designed entirely around the Geeks build system. It, I pretty much got interested in GNU Geeks um, when I, you know, caught that twinkle in the eye across the room uh, when uh, I was involved with some uh, reproducible builds and I started meeting some of the GNU Geeks folks and uh, with reproducible builds, I'm pretty excited about reproducible builds and a lot of things that we're doing with reproducible builds in Debian is kind of trying to shoehorn some new practices into a well-established system that didn't really have that built in mind. But uh, GNU Geeks has a lot of the premises of reproducible builds built into it directly. It was, it's by intention, not something we're trying to bolt on later or reintegrate. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it has a number of things where it normalizes the build environment, um, it even builds in containers, it has standardization of the build path, and it has built-in mechanisms for actually verifying the reproducibility. In Debian, a lot of these processes are pretty hard to actually integrate. We're doing the best we can, but uh, it's going to take some time. Whereas this, it's, uh, it has much more potential to be reproducible uh, right out of the gate. So one of the bizarre things where it really differs is in the file system layout. Uh, the file system hierarchy standard is, for the most part, thrown out the window. Um, so all of the software on the system goes into subdirectories under the GNU store directory. 
uh, and then uh, it will have a hash of the tool chain used to build that particular version of that package and a package and a version. Uh, there are other things also in the, the store that are uh, not specifically packages such as upstream tarballs, but they all basically follow the same basic premise. So uh, since it doesn't follow the, the file system hierarchy standard, things like your path are going to be uh, different. Uh, so uh, a lot of what it accomplishes in order to get you to use the binaries from GNU store, blah, 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 is uh, it sets the path, sets up uh, in a uh, specific order so that you typically will get the binary that your particular configuration is set up to run. Uh, so it uses a lot of symlinks to accomplish this. So first, uh, you know, you'll have your GUIX profile, which is a symlink to var GUIX profiles, which is a symlink to another profile within that directory, which is a symlink to another actual file, I think. And then, uh, and then in there is a symlink to the file that you're actually running, say you want to run Emacs, for example. So it's a whole big mess of symlinks, which is kind of, uh, which has some really interesting properties, but uh, we'll get into some of that more later. So where exactly does a binary live? Um, typically with bash, uh, you might want to run bash from the system. Uh, so it'll be in the system profile path. Um, and then uh, you'll find the actual bash is located in the GNU store, hash of toolchain, bash, the version, and bin bash. Uh, so what will be interesting here uh, is when you when you list all of the libraries that Bash uses, they all point directly to other files in the store. Uh, this has some really interesting properties when we get into the transactional upgrades and transactional rollbacks. So uh, basically, because essentially all that a package is, is a built thing shoved into a directory, uh, really, the only way you can use it is uh, through setting up your symlink tree to actually point to that one preferred over some older version. So this way, uh, in, this way, when you upgrade a set of packages, first it will build them, and then once the build completes and is successful, then it will update your symlinks. Uh, and so the act of updating a symlink can be an almost atomic operation. So the likelihood that you are ever in an inconsistent state is really quite low. It's just a bunch of file system operations. Um, and the, you can, in a desperate situation, actually manually re-implement those uh, to get yourself back into a consistent state. I've only once had to do that in the last year, but uh, it has a mechanism where you can actually switch back to any generation uh, currently available in your profile. Um, users can install packages without uh, requiring a system administrator permission, uh, which, has, uh, it, which is a double-edged sword. Um, you can, uh, every single user has an entirely independent copy of their profile. So the users upgrade their software when they want to upgrade. Uh, they're not waiting on the system administrator. Uh, and I'll talk more about the implications of that later. Uh, it's also really fairly trivial for an individual user to install a customized version of a package. So this, was, uh, this is kind of a cut and paste. Uh, the formatting didn't quite turn out great, and a lot of it's scrolled off the screen. But basically, if you're familiar with a scheme, all of the packaging is basically done in a scheme dialect called Guile. And, uh, Essentially, you can run a custom version of Geeks uh, by using the pre-installation environment and then just asking the build daemon to build this custom package for you. Uh, GUIX environment uh, is uh, the ability to, it's kind of like if you were to call 
say s root and then it will uh, or s build and then it'll drop you into a shell with all the dependencies necessary for actually building that package tweaking that package customizing it um, and so this can be really useful if you're just kind of developing a new upstream version or something you just get the build tool chain and one one really cool thing about it is because it's just uh, linking a bunch of sim it's creating a bunch of sim links to files that if they're already built uh, it, it's it's a trivial quick operation uh, it has some importers to pull package definitions from uh, other sites such as PyPy or I think there are even some Haskell ones uh, and basically it will dump a definition much like the the one earlier so it'll spit out the scheme that will give you a baseline to start hacking on a new package. And uh, kind of back to the reproducible builds issue here. Uh, so it, by design, it's intended to be able to challenge the builds. So basically, if you do a local build of Bash, you can compare against the servers on which you might download that version from. And you can even compare against multiple servers. So by design, it already has a, a, a fairly simple system for checking and seeing that you're getting the same results as uh, produced by the upstream servers. And here's an example uh, checking bash from my local system, and they were identical. Here's an example with the Linux Libre kernel. Uh, and for whatever reason, it's currently not reproducible. So you can see that they differed. And it gets a little more verbose because uh, it's a more alarming situation. Uh, upgrading a package in GNU Geeks is often as simple as updating two lines. So um, I, I've been the U-boot maintainer in Debian for many years, and so naturally one of some of the first patches I submitted to GNU Geeks were uh, to update the U-boot versions, and. So here, you're just updating the version number. And this is uh, the hash, uh, the expected hash of the upstream tarball that you use for the new version. And literally, for that version bump, that was the only thing I needed to change, uh, which uh, I think at the time, I actually used GNU Geeks to test U-boot before I tested it on Debian, because it was just so simple to just do a few tests, uh, install U-boot on a few machines, rather than going through all of the steps to update the Debian packaging, update the patch sets, those kind of things. The GNU system distribution is, um, is the full operating system level. Uh, so it includes uh, an, entire, an, an entirely new init system, which I know people love to talk about init systems. Um, that init system is, of course, written in GNU, uh, in GNU Guile. Uh, and this, uh, uh, the init system is uh, just a few lines of Guile, which of course includes much larger libraries. But this is a particular exact uh, init for this particular instantiation of this operating system. So every time you get a new init system for every time you update your system, obviously the differences vary, but so to configure a system, you pass it a uh, configuration defined in scheme. And then uh, rather than editing a bunch of configuration files in Etsy, you actually generate your configuration files. So it's kind of like configuration management by design. Um, so when you're, the running SSHD, for example, here is actually passed the configuration file in the store. Um, you can fairly trivially instantiate virtual machines. Uh, you can build a virtual machine that's basically identical to your running system configuration. And uh, it can pass the contents of the store or possibly a limited set of contents of the store to only include the things that match the same system. So this can be done quite quickly. In bug reporting, um, this will be familiar to a lot of people in Debian. It uses debugs. Uh, what's maybe a little unfamiliar is there are 
uh, only two uh, packages uh, with which to submit bugs. Maybe there are more than that. Uh, somebody might be able to correct me on that. Um, but it uses debugs. Uh, so you can use your favorite, just email it, describe your problem. Uh, you can get a list of bugs at the URLs. And um, here's where we really get into some interesting things. Uh, so you can run GUIX SD as a full-blown operating system, but you can also run uh, GNU Geeks as your own, uh, <clears throat> as, as an installation on top of another operating system, such as Debian. Um, you can download binary tarballs from the upstream uh, GNU Geeks site. Uh, you can install from source, and uh, there's been a little bit of work gone into actually packaging GNU Geeks for Debian. So one of my biggest frustrations with GNU Geeks is there's a long outstanding bug uh, where there's not really a built-in chain of trust integrated to the system. So the entirety of GNU Geeks is defined as a single Git repository. And each individual commit may be signed. Uh, in fact, I think they're required to be signed. But unfortunately, there's no built-in system for the end user to go through and verify those signatures. So there's no uh, trust key ring. There's, there's nothing like that. There's no built-in system. You can go through and manually pick, oh, I see this git commit is signed by somebody who's got a strong enough connection in my web of trust, but you can't uh, there, there's no built-in system where, oh, this is the expected set of keys that should sign things and will automatically uh, only build versions that, uh, that have been properly signed. Another really interesting effect is because every single user on a system can have their own sets of packages installed, uh, there's a system-wide profile. Even root has its own set of packages installed separate from the system profile, uh, or in addition to, rather. Uh, security update consistency across the whole machine is a little hard to audit. Um, it has some strengths. You don't force any user to upgrade you know, at a time that's inconvenient to them. Uh, but Obviously, if there are lingering security updates out there, uh, that's, that's a bit of a concern. So those are some of the big issues that have turned me away from using GNU Geeks in any serious capacity. Uh, I just uh, have a stronger concern about the, the level of security there. The updates, uh, basically, Geek's pull is essentially roughly equivalent to app get update, um, but it actually recompiles all of the available package definitions, and this takes some time. Even on a fairly modern computer, it can take a few minutes sometimes, depending on how many package updates there were, and that doesn't even include installing the packages. So, uh, the fact that when you try to update the system, it's going to take a long time uh, can really hinder people from doing those security updates that they keep putting off. Uh, so that's a big concern for me as well. Um, and it's also just practically kind of annoying to sit there watching a little spinner going on. Um, so that, that's, those are some of the big concerns I have with it as a system. I know there's some work to improve the speed on that, and I've even seen some of those improvements in my brief involvement. Um, but <clears throat> uh, And then an, another thing that can sometimes drive you crazy is a, a minor update in the tool chain can have a cascading effect on which packages get rebuilt. Um, so it's hard to know when you run an update, like just how many things are actually going to be updated. Uh, you know, oh, I want a, a new version of X, but along with that comes like an entire tool chain dependency on uh, countless other packages. Um, so sometimes updates can be, uh, even for what seems like a relatively minor update, it can be an entire, almost an entire rebuild of your system. They have some 
features that kind of uh, can work around some of those limitations uh, that are reasonably safe to use, but in my experience, every once in a while, you'll just get a huge update. Um, and additionally, uh, it's both a binary and a source-based distribution. So individual users, uh, individual users could choose to rebuild everything from source, and to some degree that's encouraged, so you can compare against the official servers, uh, and that gives greater assurances with regards to reproducibility. Um, but uh, but there are also uh, binary servers that are basically rebuilding all of the rebuilding all of the packages. But uh, you know, Git pushes can go a lot faster than the binary servers may be up for rebuilding. And so, at any given time, you might do an update, and you can download a lot of the binaries, or you end up rebuilding the world. Um, and that can be a little awkward and uh, challenging at times. Another thing is um, I, I, I don't have much background in Scheme or Lisp or anything like that, and I, the, the parenthesis for uh, updating package definitions, it kind of always has this feel like it looks very elegant and straightforward, and then I actually try to do it, and you miss a paren somewhere, and you get a very uh, explosive traceback trying to figure out how it goes. Your mileage may vary on that, but uh, sometimes I find it a little overwhelming. Uh, just you define something, and boom, and you don't know where it was, and maybe you didn't uh, fastidiously commit to Git while you were hacking on it. Um, that's basically... That's the gist of things. Um, I really have, uh, I've been using Debian for ages. Uh, I, I love it. Um, I do sometimes wonder if some of the things that GNU geeks are doing might better handle things like, uh, like PyPy and uh, RubyGems and things like that where the entire ecosystem is just moving a lot faster than Debian can keep track. So that's one of the things I've been interested in this uh, GNU Geeks is it's much easier to do uh, updates to individual packages without necessarily having to do an entire transition. Um, those kind of things, uh, you, you can do uh, individual packages to just test updates without needing to build the entire ecosystem around that. You can just build it for your little test. Um, and uh, yeah, so a, a huge thanks to both Debian, which has uh, really built me into a free software developer uh, on some level, and uh, GNU Geeks for being a small welcoming community. Um, that's it for my slides, but I have a number of demos I could get into, and um, uh, why don't we take a few questions, and then maybe I can respond with some demos or something like that. Um, speaking of PyPy and Ruby Germs, uh, is there any prospects uh, for some auto-translation of uh, the language-specific package manager recipe into the Geeks format? Yeah, there's, a, there's an importer which can basically, um, in my experience, I've done a few PyPy packages with it, and with some of them, it just worked out of the box. You say uh, geeks import PyPy and then the package name, uh, and then it'll, out, it'll output the, the package definition in the guile format. Um, and some of those have worked, and some of them needed some additional tweaking, pulling in a few more PyPy modules, things like that. Um, so there's work there. I don't know how fully automated it is. There's always probably going to be some degree of manual checking, and it's code, so it can be improved. <laughs> What's that? Ah, that gets more interesting. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, uh, also for Debian source packages. Yeah, I racked my brains a bit at how I could more closely bring some of the features of GNU Geeks into Debian, and it's a bit hard. <laughs> but yeah, it's a very different paradigm. Uh, uh, not to say it's impossible, but I think the Debian project might move a bit slow to make that a reality. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned 
updates sometimes needing uh, to rebuild a lot of stuff, that presumably applies to security updates as well. So if you get a, a libc security update, you then have to rebuild absolutely everything? Don't near, very close, <laughs> yeah, right. at times. Right, uh, my understanding of this, the way that the, the system is set up with this whole functional model, um, that's, kind of, that's kind of baked in. Do they have a bodge for that? They do, I believe it's a system called graphs, um, and it kind of fudges the like, well, so uh, if you remember, every package, you might have 10 different versions of bash 4.0. Uh, and each version is basically the tool chain used to build it. They, I believe, and I, and I don't understand in great detail, but I believe this, the graph system will take, uh, will take whatever the most recent bash is and use that, or, or, or libc is probably a better example. We'll take whatever the matching, as long as the version matches, we'll kind of pretend that that is actually built with this other tool chain and do some tricks like that. So that helps a bit with that. Um, that's actually, that kind of reminds me also of, uh, I neglected to put it in my slides, but one of the biggest uh, frustrations I have with GNU Geeks um, as somebody who kind of came into the free software world as a system administrator is they have no concept of stable updates. It's all, it's basically all a rolling release at this point. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the security updates are just normal package updates, essentially. Does that Thanks. answer your question? Hi. Okay. Any other questions? Or I can just start to dive into some examples. All right. Okay. Well, hey Grant. Hey Grant. Yeah, I had a quick question. You you mentioned that uh, each user, including root, has its own environment and its own set of, set of more or less home built packages that are not system wide. Uh, is there any particular reason why uh, why when a user wants to have a package built, it cannot be but in uh, slash GNU store to, for the, to have the duplication with other users? Uh, yes, so when another user, so you have user A, they install a package, and then user B installs the same package, all they have to do is make the symlinks. So the second user or system or whatever to install it, they, they, they share the same store. Okay. Um, but and it, then it's just a trivial symlink operation. So that also gets into things like, um, like uh, how about Geek's environment? So here, um, basically, I've probably already run it. So it was a trivial operation. Uh, it went, it built a, a uh, cheroot that essentially has only the stuff necessary for to build the hello package. Um, so this, uh, uh, because it didn't really show you much, um, why don't I try with another one? Um, so here, uh, it's basically building a cheroot, kind of like uh, what uh, pbuilder or sbuild would do, except uh, because many of the dependencies might already be available, uh, because the you know I've installed other packages which have this thing this in the store. It doesn't actually have to go through, unpack the packages, uh, do all do all of those operations. They're basically already on the system, and so it can just do a nice quick symlink tree. Uh, to instantiate that, yeah. Working. Working. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, sometimes you need to rebuild uh, the packages and all the dependencies, and that you can have several versions of the same library on a system. So, is it working on old machines? So, if you have if you have uh, old hardware. Uh, is it going to be working, for example, if you have a small HED or not very um, efficient processor? Right. Um, so naturally, one of the things I started doing with uh, Geeks is to uh, 
since I work on ARM systems a lot, uh, I basically added support for a number of ARM boards. And uh, one of them was a single core ARM processor with half a gig of RAM. And it sometimes took a day to do the most basic operations. Uh, but there are some really nice features. Uh, let's see. So there are some really cool features where I would build uh, the entire system on a faster machine. And then, uh, and then I, you can actually uh, publish all of your build results. Uh, everything in the store is basically something that should be publicly available. Uh, and so you can have kind of peer-to-peer -peer setup where each, you know, this machine trusts that machine to build packages and it can just download them from a faster machine that's already built them. Um, so that's one of the really nice features. Um, but yeah, uh, but even then there are some things that still need to be run locally just as part of the process or if they don't build reproducibly enough or something, then it's like, no, no, I got to rebuild this myself. See you in a few days. So yes, on slow machines, it can be a bit challenging. There, I believe there's a way where you can rebuild everything from source and not trust any binaries, but I don't know about the, I, I haven't found any way to do the converse where it's like, uh, if a binary is not available, don't bother installing it. Um, so, yeah. For, for these build machines, uh, I, I can imagine that the C flags or the LD flags will affect the binary. So is that taking into account into the reproducibility? Yes. Uh, so since it's functional package definition, let's see if I've got this right. Uh, because it's functional, uh, so here, um, Basically, the input is the entire scheme information that produces that package. And so uh, you'll see like it'll pass cross-compile arguments um, uh, and all of the inputs that go into the file are there. I wonder, do we have C flag specified anywhere? So um, one really exciting thing is the entire repository is just one Git repo. I mean, so, and realistically, like we've got a distribution here that has maybe a third of the packages in Debian, give or take a little. Uh, and those packages are represented in, you know, an 89 megabyte Git repository. So it, it has references to the tarballs and hashes of what it expects to find or references to uh, Git, other Git repositories and it has a hash to make sure you get the correct thing. Um, but so you can, to look for things like that, you can do things like git grep. Oh, okay, in various packages, so we could look in GNU packages Android, and we can see it sets the C flags for uh, Android lib CU utils. Uh, never seen this package before, but uh, so basically, if you change anything in the package definition, it's going to result in a in a new definition of the package. So any kind of C flags type changes. Um, are going to propagate into any of the things that uh, use that as an input. Um, otherwise, in Debian terms, kind of like a build dependency. Uh, it'll cascade down the whole system and everything that used that will be rebuilt. Um, okay. Oh. Can I interrupt briefly and say uh, that seems to imply that I'm forbidden now from just setting C flags in the environment because that will totally mess everything up. Yes, uh, forbidden, well, it'll just be ignored. <laughs> so you can set it all you want. <laughs> um, but uh, it's fairly simple to uh, edit individual packages, but I guess if you're wanting to set a global change or something like that, that that's more what you were getting at. Yeah, um, yeah, you can't, uh, you actually need to specify, uh, because it's functional, you need to specify all of your inputs in order to produce the output. Uh, so all of the inputs are defined in the given package. So, 
So here, here I've got uh, the ARM trusted firmware package I worked on briefly uh, to get uh, an upstream version of it. Uh, currently packaged in GNU Geeks, they have the um, they have uh, ARM trusted firmware. All of the targets are actually built with uh, with they're all built with uh, custom vendor repositories. This is kind of a thing in the ARM world where just about everything is built with a custom vendor repository. But finally, uh, they added some support in upstream ARM trusted firmware. So I started working on a packaging definition for that. And you'll notice um, there's a function kind of right at the top there, make ARM trusted firmware. So you can use functions to define packages that they then inherit uh, all the baseline for it, and you only specify how they differ from the main package. So if you did want you know, uh, one or two packages that uh, shared kind of a common build system or something, you could define that in one of these uh, function definitions, and then uh, you could create a local version of that package. So here, I'll try this one. So here I'm running a build. So when you use the pre-inst environment, that's kind of a hack to work around uh, updating all of the package definitions. It kind of just, I'm not even sure exactly how it works, but uh, basically you build a, a particular implementation of GNU Geeks and then it will kind of reuse as much as it can and spit out a bunch of warnings. But here, I've just built, uh, I've just built a new version of ARM Trusted Firmware, uh, which is now located in GNU Store, blah, 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 blah. Um, another question? Yes. Um, so you just mentioned that we can basically, oh, people can generally more or less write arbitrary GUIL code as for package definitions. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have like some particularly cool uses for that? And uh, do you also have some cases where it just makes package definition hard to analyze either by hand or uh, automatically? Um, on the latter case, I have a harder time defining that, but I think, uh, I don't know if you've ever looked at the UFOOT packages in Debian, but um, the U-boot, like for example here, I've got U-boot one board, and it's a two-line change, and now I support an entirely new board in the Debian packaging that usually takes editing four or five files and making sure you get it right. Um, some of that's maybe my own fault, and it could be done more elegantly, but, um, but things like this I find to be tremendously useful. Any anytime you have a, a project in which you might have multiple versions in the archives, say a console only version and an X version and a Wayland version or something like that, um, this uh, this kind of approach really makes it easy to define multiple different versions. Uh, you can also get, like, say the Wayland version isn't ready yet, but you want to add support for this package. You can start by s submitting a, a version that only does the console utilities first, and then it's already there, and maybe somebody else comes along and adds another variant, um, and it's, it's pretty trivial to add. Uh, and there was a second part to your question. Yeah, do you have cases where basically you would want to for instance, automatically grab for whatever package information, like find all packages that have this or that feature, and just it's hard because now you have to more or less execute arbitrary code to understand it. Yeah. Um, oh, Quicks already uh, runs the code, so. <laughs> right. Um, it's got, I mean, you can search for packages, kind of like app cache search. Uh, Oh boy. Let's see how that does. Um, right, so it puts out a boatload of stuff um, sorted by relevance. Uh, it probably looks fairly similar to your typical Debian packaging format. So you can kind of search, um, there are package definitions. Um, I do find git grep to be extremely useful for searching for common things or searching for a package that's doing something that I might need to cargo cult <laughs> into another package definition. 
Um, but just the fact that the entire operating system is in one Git repository makes some of that analysis possible, I think, much easier than with Debian, where all of the packages are scattered between uh, countless you know, tarballs and archives and sources.debian.net simplifies it somewhat, but uh, it, obviously uh, using common utilities with Git uh, uh, on a 89 megabyte repository is going to be a lot faster. <coughs> a lot. And I think the answer to or, or to put it, my specific question was, I guess, Guix already turns like that arbitrary code into package definition we can search, it seems. Yeah. Let's see if I can find one for you. Oh, boy. So also, it drives me crazy that GNU Geeks puts the hash. I, re I really wish it had been package version hash. <laughs> um, makes tab completion a lot easier. Um, but that's not the way it is. And to change that would be a lot of work uh, or a lot of rebuilding everything. Um, so it would require rebootstrapping the whole thing. But anyway, uh, t I was trying to. Ah, yes. Uh, the GNU store is essentially read-only. Um, there's a daemon running. Yeah, I'll try and explain that. That's a, uh, so somebody uh, mentioned uh, they don't want you to touch GNU store. Um, so there's essentially a daemon running. So one thing about all of your binaries being in this one directory with uh, GNU store, big long hash, package name, uh, uh, Processes that are running uh, tend to have very long names and are a bit hard to sort out. But basically, uh, here's an example. Uh, this is the Geeks daemon running. Uh, currently, I believe it's essentially a fork of it's a fork of uh, the the Nix daemon. Uh, there's work in progress to rewrite it in Scheme, but for now. Um, Essentially, this is running where it's uh, when you do a package installation, it's basically you call out to the daemon and you say, hey, I'd like this package. And then the daemon will go and it will check all of the essentially uh, inputs for that package. And in this case, it will look for substitute servers on berlin.guix, berlinguixxd.org and mirrorhydra.gnu.org. And it will check for, uh, uh, do I have any binaries I can just download and save you a bunch of time? Uh, and then anything it doesn't find in the entire chain of whatever it is you're trying to install, uh, it will then uh, download the sources, start building it, and uh, where was I going with this? Ah, yes. Uh, so the daemon then can has some special privilege to uh, remount the GNU store uh, as needed, as writable, and then inject any of the objects it either downloaded or built into the store. So um, so one of the workflows that I really liked about GNU Geeks was uh, in Debian, uh, I'm packaging bootloaders, and with the ARM64 systems, they pretty much all require ARM-trusted firmware. But almost every ARM-trusted firmware is some vendor fork somewhere. And it, to get it into Debian right now, we only have a single vendor fork of ARM-trusted firmware for all winner systems. Uh, and it doesn't even cover all, all, all winner systems. So in GNU Geeks, it's fairly simple to say, to add just one more package definition that shares a bit of the same system as the other ones, because you can inherit the existing packaging, and then add, well, actually, I want to use this for upstream for this particular ver variant. Uh, and that was a lot easier to actually get a U-boot package that has kind of everything ready to build out of the box. Um, so yes, question. Yes, question from IRC. Is GNU GUIX suitable for self-contained cross-compiling? Uh, yes. Um, well, I don't know about self-contained per se, but it does have a pretty good support for cross-compiling. Uh, I've been cross-compiling U-boot, a kernel, uh, ARM-trusted firmware, those sorts of things. 
And I, I think it even uses a, a bit of uh, functional magic in order to actually derive the cross compiler rather than, rather than having to build an entirely new package out of it. Um, so I'm, I was pretty excited to see the cross compiling support, which in Debian is only kind of a recent addition. Um, So, um, so there's a bug report uh, to do a request for packaging on Debian, and uh, I don't know if anybody else is as if this has sparked their interest in that. Uh, it could sure use a lot of help to actually get anywhere. It will probably also require a Debian policy exception because of the uh, file system hierarchy standard not really being a thing for with geeks, but. Uh, because you can install it on a foreign distribution, I think it, it can be really useful for end users to be able to uh, update to newer versions of software where De it's not really appropriate for Debian. Uh, you can run Debian as the base system, and then uh, all the user packages that you actually uh, find that you actually interact with, or maybe a select set. I think it you might have a, a bit quicker uh, uptake than, say, with uh, the backports. Um, it's got its quirks um, because you'll have to set your path appropriately to get uh, to actually be able to use these things. But um, yeah, that's about it. Um, all right. Well, uh, thanks for hearing me uh, ramble on a bit. Um, and uh, thanks to both the Debian and GNU Geeks projects. Uh, you've you've uh, shown me a lot of great things, and I hope to contribute back more.